this is the Navigating Adult ADHD podcast, here to help you navigate and thrive with ADHD in adulthood. I'm your host, Zena, and I was diagnosed at age 36. As with many ADHDers, I have a rebellious and non-conformist style. And that means that there will likely be swearing in the coming episode. Please be mindful of any little people. Hello, my friends and my fellow ADHDers. I got to tell you a funny story before we dive in because I had such an ADHD moment two nights ago. I was on social media and I saw the story about the, um, I think it's called a submersive, the uh, boat that has gone missing that was on its way to the Titanic, Titanic uh, wreckage or shipwreck, shall we say. And anyway, I didn't even know this was a thing. I didn't even know it existed. And it's very tragic. It has gone missing. And at the time of recording this, um, they are still hopeful to find it. So all my my hopes and prayers are with them being found, as well as the refugees who are missing, presumed dead, which is friggin' awful. Uh, I have serious thoughts about the, how little news coverage that is getting, as opposed to the Titanic uh, mission coverage. <laughs> anyway, my point is, the ADHD in me and what happened was I didn't know this was a thing. And it mentioned how this, um, kind of like, it's like a mini submarine, I think it's called a submersive, uh, or sub, sub, something or other. Anyway, how it was able to go down to almost four kilometers down in depth into the ocean, almost that, where the Titanic boat is on the bottom of the ocean anyway I was like wow the ocean is four kilometers in depth that's fascinating I was like I bet that's not the deepest I wonder how deep it goes because that's a really long way so I started googling how deep the ocean is and I found out that it goes down to roughly 11 to 12 kilometers in depth in places and then I start looking at like wow okay well what sort of sea life is at the ocean at that depth and then I'm looking at you know images of sea creatures that live in the bottom of the ocean and I found that there is this sea cucumber that is transparent and it breathes through its anus and then that was just so amusing to me that this is like 9 30 at night I just start cracking up laughing and my partner's like what how on earth did you get there how did you find that so then I had to like go all the way back to try and explain to him how I'd got to that point <laughs> and then I'm like looking at images of the ocean and that depth and then how far down like mankind has explored and how far how much of the ocean we've actually been able to look at and then there was this thing about like the potential of aliens living in the ocean because we've only explored five percent of the ocean and friends that sums up the ADHD experience so beautifully <laughs> when we get hyper fixated on something so fascinating anyway it's not what we're here to talk about we are going to talk about handling rejection and criticism and I'm going to give you the exact tools that I use to handle this myself and that I use when I'm coaching my clients or teaching them how to handle rejection and criticism in their own life. So very often our fear of being rejected or criticized or even our perceived fear of that can be paralyzing. It can literally stop us from taking action. And I experienced this in my life and I didn't realize that this was what it was until my ADHD diagnosis. And I was able to reflect back and see, wow, that one of the reasons or part of the reason that I chose to avoid dating for such a long period of time, I was single for, for over 10 years, I avoided that area of my life because I was so afraid of the rejection. I was so afraid of being criticized by someone um, in that environment. And that therefore 
kept me single for a long time. Now, don't get me wrong, I had an amazing single life. I did so many incredible things and became such a strong, independent woman. I wouldn't trade it for the world. However, I now understand myself so much better and I can see one of the reasons I avoided finding someone to share my life with and avoided dating and all of those things was because of that fear or perceived fear of being rejected. Now, we often as ADHDers, we are, you know, we can be incredibly sensitive. I know I am. I am hypersensitive (laughs) and we can take it incredibly personally and we can use it against ourselves as if it is evidence that we aren't good enough. And I've also got to mention that with ADHD, it is very common for us to experience RSD, rejection, sensitive dysphoria. So again, for those of us with ADHD, the idea or perceived idea of rejection can be incredibly uh, scary and hard and, like I said, paralyzing. Now, according to research, the ideal praise to criticism ratio is five to one. So what that means is that we need to be giving people five pieces of, you know, praise or positive reinforcement, positive feedback to every one piece of criticism or um, constructive feedback for them to have. Now, I know this is something that We tried to apply um, in many of my management roles, although at that time I didn't know the ratio was five to one. We were operating more on a three to one ratio, but five to one makes so much more sense to me. And I do wonder if for those of us with ADHD, even that ratio isn't necessarily high enough because you've probably had this experience and I know I have where somebody has maybe said all of these wonderful, amazing, beautiful things, or you might've had like a, a lot of really good feedback come through And then there's this one thing that someone says, and that's all you hear. You hold on to it. You obsess over it. You forget everything else, right? You totally discount all the other things, right? I go to a Toastmasters meeting most weeks, and I've been going for years now. And if you don't know, Toastmasters is where you go to practice your public speaking skills. When I first started going, I was terrified of public speaking, hence why I chose to go. And they have this wonderful thing in my club, which is quite unique, where they have little tiny slips of paper that are just a little bit bigger than a post-it note. And when you give a speech, everyone who is there watching is asked to give you positive feedback on those slips. And they write them and then they hand them to you at the end and you get to kind of take them away and read them when you get home. And When you give a speech, you are also provided feedback by a person who evaluates you. So one person has dedicated a role where they introduce you before your speech and then they provide feedback in the form of CRC, which is commend, recommend, commend after your speech. So the whole purpose of going, obviously, is to build your skills. And what that means is that you're going to be given feedback constructively in order to, you know, hone your skills and craft your skills and get better and better. Now, I remember some of the earlier speeches that I did where people, you know, you would get all of these slips of wonderful things from from all of these people who had liked certain elements throughout your speech or said, you know, you were really confident up there or I loved how you said this or how you did this or you used pause beautifully. But back then, I would so often hold on to that one piece of, you know, constructive feedback from the evaluator who perhaps had said I recommend that instead of looking at the slides when you speak that you glance at your slides and then look at the audience otherwise you can lose us or we can't hear you and I would often take that and I would think oh my god I really did it wrong or I should have known better or you know that probably wasn't even that good and these people are just saying nice things to what's the word placate me (laughs) I don't know But you know what I mean? Like our brains are so good at doing that. (laughs) I think that's almost our kind of default setting. But we can also use uh, tools to reframe that. Now, one of the things that I do when I give a speech, this is something that I decided incredibly early on, 
is when I give a speech at Toastmasters or now that I actually do a bit more public speaking in the community and online as well, when I do that, I I have this rule with myself where I'm only allowed to give myself positive feedback and positive um, support after for the duration of that day until the next day. And I'm going to explain a little bit more of this as I give you the three tips. So what that means is like when I give a speech at Toastmasters or when I go and give a talk, you know, in a school or in a community, in a workplace, when I run a webinar or something online, I only allow myself to say good, nice things and appreciate what I did well until the next day. That is when I'm allowed to evaluate myself. But for the remainder of that day, I focus on the good. And that is purely because I know from experience that our brain likes to go straight to what didn't work, what we should do differently, and where we sucked, basically. Like our brain is naturally self-critical. It is, right? We have a slight tendency to lean to self-critical. Now that's in all of us, not just in our neurodivergent brains, for those of us with ADHD, but in neurotypical people too. Okay, so knowing that we all have that tendency, having made that decision ahead of time that I'm not going to say anything negative or anything constructive until tomorrow, that decision's already made and I've become really good at doing that. So all of that to say, in a very roundabout way, that we can, you know, rewire our brains to a degree to be able to change that self-critical habit or that obsession over that negative thing. Now, I will say that I think this is a lot harder when we are almost blindsided with it or not expecting it. When I'm talking about it in this Toastmasters example, or often if we have like, um, I remember in leadership roles, I would do monthly one-to-ones with my team members and, you know, we would be going through what they'd done well and we would look at, you know, some areas for improvement. So it was expected. You weren't being blindsided necessarily. It was often something that you had, you know, already you know, addressed or saw coming or, you know, you were expecting to get feedback. And I think that's quite different to when we're not necessarily expecting it. Okay. Um, One other thing I wanted to say here is when we're able to separate out our worth as a human from the criticism or the rejection that we receive from that feedback other people give us, when we're able to separate out our worth from it and still hear it, we actually have an opportunity to learn, to grow and to build resilience. Okay. So as we dive into these three tips that I have for handling rejection and criticism, I want to preface it. I'm using all these words that I don't really use, but they sound correct in the right order. Anyway, We'll continue. (laughs) You know that I'm going to go Google it later, right? And probably end up down this rabbit hole of God knows what. Anyway, uh, this episode was not what I was going to record today. I was going to record a completely different episode for you. However, I think this is beautiful and relevant today because I'm in it. When I say I'm in it, I had a lunchtime meeting scheduled for today and I was so looking forward to it. Now, this person had cancelled on me last week. I'm not sure why, but they just explained that they couldn't make the meeting. Could we move it to this week, a week later? And I said, of course, no worries. I'm looking forward to it. One hour before we were due to meet for this meeting, the person messaged me and said, look, something has come up at work. I am not going to be able to meet today. Are we able to perhaps do this on the phone at another time? To which I said, and you know, as soon as I got that message, I must say, like, I was so disappointed. This is a meeting I've been really, really looking forward to. It's a conversation I'm so excited to have with someone, uh, let's say, prominent in the ADHD community. And I was just really disappointed. I think that's exactly how I felt. And so I replied to this person and said, yes, of course, no worries. That's such a shame. I was really looking forward to it. Um, Let me know if you would prefer to set up a phone call or a Zoom conversation. Anyway, as the day has gone on, I have not had a reply back. And we are now five hours later. And 
I had noticed throughout the afternoon that I started to get this kind of sinking feeling in my stomach and this almost kind of hollowish feeling in my chest and and stomach region. And so I really tuned into that because I, I was busy. I had a lot of other things that I went on to do. And as I sat down to start drafting this episode and think about what I was going to share with you all today, which was something else entirely, I tuned into that and I started to see that I was really, really taking this as a rejection and I was taking it personally and that I had really gone on to make it mean that this person actually doesn't want to meet me and they are avoiding it and it's probably not going to happen so I shouldn't get my hopes up okay so all of that context to say I'm going to walk you through these three tips that I have with that in mind and just show you how I'm applying that okay so the first thing I do when it comes to handling rejection and criticism is I ask myself a set of questions and I have four questions I ask myself and when possible I write down those answers. So the reason I encourage that is when we get out of our heads and onto paper we get to slow ourselves down, help to slow and calm our nervous system at the same time as well as it it helps to give us a better perspective because Hello, my friends, we have such busy ADHD brains, they move very fast, we can have a lot of things going on in our head at one time. But when we're able to get out of our heads and write things down, we're able to just focus on what we've written down and make more sense of it without focusing on multiple things at the same time and going in all different directions. (laughs) I know you know what I mean. (laughs) So the four questions are, number one, what am I making this mean? Number two, is it a 100% true? Number three, what else could it mean? And number four is what do I want to make it mean? So starting at the top, what am I making this mean? When somebody criticizes us, when they give us feedback that perhaps we weren't expecting, perhaps they tell us, you don't look very good in that outfit. That dress doesn't really suit you. Or maybe rejection, somebody, you say to somebody, hey, would you like to go out for a coffee with me? And they say, no, um, I don't really want to do that. Okay, it can show up in multiple ways. But what happens is we take their words and their actions, maybe it's their feedback, and we make that mean something. So this person t- text me asking to reschedule. Now, they haven't replied for five hours. I have made that mean they no longer want to do it. Maybe they don't like me. Maybe they don't really want to talk to me. You know, like my brain has made it mean all sorts of different things. Maybe it's not going to happen. Maybe I shouldn't have got my hopes up. Like my brain has made it mean a slew of different things that have me feeling rejected, disappointed, afraid, and a bunch of other emotions, okay? So when we're able to identify what we are making it mean, we can start to see that maybe, just maybe, that isn't necessarily 100% true, which brings us to the second question of, is it 100% true? Is it 100% true that this person doesn't want to meet with me? No, I don't. I haven't had them say that. Until they say that, I don't know that it's true. Okay. Um, Is it 100% true that this person doesn't like me? No, I have no evidence to suggest that. Is it 100% true it's not going to happen? Nope, no evidence to suggest that. But even if you did have all of that evidence, you would still be making those things mean something about you. And it could be, well, you know, Let me give you the actual context, a different context of a client that I was coaching not that long ago who had been arranged, had been chatting with somebody on a dating app and they were arranging to meet and she really liked this person and she got the impression that he really liked her. And so they arranged a time to, and a place to meet and then he ghosted her. He just disappeared completely. 
And she made that mean he didn't like her and she wasn't good enough and a whole bunch of other negative things. And of course she felt terrible. Now, is it 100% true that he didn't like her? We don't know that. Is it 100% true that he didn't think she was good enough? We don't know that, right? We don't have that evidence. That's just what our brain is choosing to make it mean. And this is such, it might seem, it might sound like yogurt, yogurt, whatever. I always use that example because my mum says yogurt and it grates on me because I say yogurt. But anyway, um, we, the reason why this is so important is because what we make it mean will determine how we feel. So when we make it mean I'm not good enough because this person ghosted me, we feel terrible. When we make it mean, you know, this person doesn't want to meet with me or it's never going to happen and we feel disappointed, it's because of that thought that we're believing, the meaning that we have attached to something. And that is optional. And that's what I really, really want to show you by question three, which is what else could it mean? Okay, what else could it mean? The message, the text message that I got, the fact that five hours have passed, it could mean she does have a work emergency. She is busy. Something else has come up. Um, Something serious has happened that she has to take care of. It might mean nothing about me whatsoever. It might mean nothing about our meeting whatsoever. It's actually possible that she's looking forward to it and is disappointed herself that she hasn't been able to meet it, to, to make it. I don't know, possibly, right? Which brings me to question four is what do I want to make it mean? Because ultimately I get to choose I get to choose what I make it mean that she hasn't replied. I get to choose, you know, when you see somebody's read a text message and your brain's like, oh, hell no. Why haven't you replied? Have you read that? What are you thinking? What did I say wrong? What did I do wrong? Fuck, what did I forget? You know, you know how that happens? It's not just me, right? (laughs) Right? Like we get to decide what we make it mean. I am one of those people who will read a message and I will screenshot it with the intention of replying later. And because, hello, I have ADHD, I often forget. And my intention with the screenshot is to like see it and remember to reply, but I forget. And it has nothing to do with that person. But I tell you what, I've had people reach out and be like, oh my gosh, what have I done? I'm so sorry. Did I say something wrong? Did I do something wrong? You haven't replied, but I see you've seen it or read it. And it's like, no, 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 it's nothing to do with you. It's because I forgot and you're awesome. And I totally love what you said, (laughs) right? But notice how we can do that. We can attach meaning to something without it necessarily being said, right? So that question at the end is so powerful. What do I want to make it mean? I want to make this mean she's busy. And she has a lot going on and she is still super keen and interested. And I'm going to reach out later. That's it. Like, I just want to make it mean she's busy. She's got a lot going on. She's still super keen and interested. Okay. Now, over the years, I've heard the saying, and you've probably heard it too. The worst that can happen is that someone says no. Right. So when you um, start your own business and you start selling services, when you ask someone out on a date, right, somebody will say to you, like the worst that happens is that they say no. Now, what I know now is that 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 actually is not true. I call bullshit. (laughs) The worst that happens is not that they say no or reject us or criticize us. The worst that happens is what we make their words or their actions mean about us. That is the worst that happens. The worst that happens is what we make it mean about us. And that shit is optional, my friends. All right, so number two, I've got three tips for you guys. Number two, the second tip that I have for you And what I do and what I'm going to do in this exact instance is sleep on it before taking action or responding. 
That is huge for me. And there will be times where I might just need to reply and say, look, I'm just going to sleep on it and get back to you tomorrow. Sometimes that, you know, there are times where you need to acknowledge things, but I've never had pushback on that. Most, I, I can't think of any instance anyway. But the whole point of this is, you know, oftentimes we need to allow our, you know, our nervous system to calm down a bit. If we are dealing with rejection or criticism, quite often we can get into a fight, flight, freeze or fawn response. And, you know, our nervous system can be freaking out and we can be operating from this place of safety at all costs kind of thing. And that's, you know, one of the things I will always remember, and I don't even know who said it, is like when emotions are high, intelligence can be low. And what can happen when we are, you know, perhaps in the state of fight or flight, as I'll just abbreviate it, fight or flight about, you know, being rejected or criticized is our emotions are really, really high and really heightened. And with time and with sleep, we can gain a better perspective as during that time, what will start to happen is our body will hope Hopefully, not always, but hopefully start to calm down. All right. And we're going to have another episode on how we can do that, how we can calm our nervous system and support our nervous system through, you know, grounding techniques and different practices. But the ability to sleep on it, you may have noticed like if you are ever up late at night and you're trying to deal with something, it can often seem so much worse at night because when we are sleep deprived, when we are tired, things are heightened. When we are able to sleep, when we are able to allow some time, that gives us the ability to also gain other perspectives. Okay, so number two, sleep on it before taking action or responding. Now, number three, I love this one. So number three is I ask myself this question. What is the most loving thing that I can do for me right now? Now, this question helps to offer ourselves love and compassion in that moment. Because when we are feeling rejected or feeling criticized, Often we're using that to fuel this narrative of I'm not good enough. There's something wrong with me. I need to change. I need to be better, do better, all of these things. And that can be incredibly painful. So when we can offer ourselves the love and the compassion that we would want to offer someone else in that same scenario, that helps hugely. Okay. So again, that question is, what is the most loving thing I can do for me right now? And I was thinking about that question as I was like making the notes for this episode. And for me, the most loving thing I could do for me right now, one of them was to actually show up and record this episode with you all and be completely honest and share where I'm at and be in it with you all and help other people navigate this. That, that to me just felt like such a loving thing to do. And the other one is one of the things I absolutely love is hot showers. After this, <laughs> I'm going to have a long hot shower. That is something else that I can do that is super loving for me. One of the other things that I did a little bit earlier on is I just reached out to a friend who I considered to be like a safe, non-judgmental friend. And I just shared with her exactly what's going on. And she held the space for me. And that just felt really good to reach out to someone and have them, you know, just, just hear me. And there are so many different ways that you can answer that question. What is the most loving thing I can do for me right now? I will often say to my clients, like, what does it look like to have your own back? Right, That's another way that you could ask that question. What does it look like to have your own back? Okay. And in every single scenario, it's going to be different. It may be similar, right? But it's going to be different for each of us. So, Last thing I wanted to say is a few years ago now I got some podcast feedback and I actually have two podcasts so you guys are hearing my newest and don't tell the other guys favoritest one (laughs) navigating adult ADHD 
However, a few years ago on my other podcast, I got some feedback that was pretty negative, really. And I was actually shocked at how little it affected me because I had known prior to that that I really had to work through this process of, you know, identifying what I'm making it mean and questioning the truth in it and looking at what else I could make it mean, separating myself from the feedback, all of that. However, this was quite a different experience, which really stands out to me because I was able to see the truth in what they had said without making it mean anything about me as a human. So if if I remember rightly, the feedback was um, something about how in in the they they were unable to keep listening because I would say right all the time and it was incredibly frustrating and annoying and they couldn't get over it so they had to stop listening. And as I thought about it and reflected on it as I was reading it, I knew straight away that they were right. <laughs> For lack of a better choice of words, they were right. I did and I have been actively working on this because I listened back to some of my podcasts and it bothered me when I heard it but I did used to say right all the time and I think that was because I had listened to a lot of uh, podcasts that were at the time more in America I don't know if that's an American thing to do but anyway the podcast I was listening to they were saying it quite a lot and so I had mimicked that and was saying it too and I didn't like it but I knew I could change it if I wanted to change it. And I also knew that the content was really, really good and that this person was correct in what they were saying. It, I did say it a lot. And if it bothered them, that was okay. They didn't have to keep listening. So I wanted to just share that story with you to kind of demonstrate that it is possible to see the truth in other people's criticism or feedback, constructive feedback, rejection, whatever it is, right? I I think all of those things were kind of applicable in the feedback that this person gave. It is possible to see the truth in that and also separate you and your worth as a human and not make it mean anything about you personally. And I really hope and I really encourage you to use these tools, these three tips that I've given you here today, because that is the exact structure I use, right, to go through when I need to go through this process. And there are times when I do, and today is one of them. All right, my friends. So just to recap, in case you wanted to hear them again and you want to write them down. The first one is I ask myself the four questions and I write it down wherever possible. Number one, what am I making this mean? Number two, is it 100% true? And if you say yes, can you know for sure? Could you prove it in a court of law? Could you prove it to everybody? (laughs) Number three, what else could it mean? Brainstorm some ideas, ask other people, get creative. And number four, what do I want to make it mean? Then the second thing is to sleep on it before taking action or responding. And then the third one is to ask yourself the question, what is the most loving thing I can do for me right now? All right, my friends, that is it for this episode on handling rejection and criticism. Huge, huge love to you all. I'll speak to you next week. Hey, friend. I know exactly what it's like to feel frustrated and confused with your ADHD and to wish that you could better understand what the hell is going on in your brain. And that's exactly why I created my coaching program, Thriving with ADHD. Inside Thriving with ADHD, you learn a step-by-step process to set and finally achieve your goals, to understand yourself and your ADHD. It's where you learn to feel better and manage your emotions and create systems and processes that work for you with your ADHD brain. This is designed for you to learn how to thrive with ADHD so you can create the life that you were meant to live. Visit xenajones.com ADHD to learn more and book a consultation.